Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is George Tulevsky, and I'm here to tell you about carbon nanotubes for digital logic. And I'm specifically going to focus on the material science challenges. So I'll tell you a few things. I want to tell you, one, why we're even bothering trying to use CNTs for digital logic. I'll tell you a bit about what has to be done for that to actually happen. And then I'm going to tell you about you know, how far we've come and what the, what the current status is and what needs to be done to make that, to make that happen. So I'll first start about, I mean, the heart of digital logic, of course, is the MOSFET. So let me just tell you a bit about how it works. So on the top left, you see an actual diagram of a MOSFET. We have a source, a drain, and a channel. Uh, so current flows from the source to the drain. And there's an oxide and a gate on top. And you apply a voltage to this gate to modulate the currents inside the channel. It's a very simple switch in a sense. So if there's no voltage on the gate, we have no current. That's the zero state, the off state. And then if I apply a voltage to the gate, you basically just have a capacitor there. You accumulate charge in the channel, and now current can flow, and you have a high current state, or the one state, or the on state, all meaning, meaning the same thing. So the zero and one state is what we use for binary logic. Again, it's just a simple switch, but in this case, there's no mechanical parts, parts like there is in a light switch, and you actually have gain, uh, which is important for doing digital logic. So what we've been able to do as an industry over the last 30 years is shrink the devices. So we call this Denard scaling. So the point is to make the device smaller, we shrink the oxide thickness, we shrink the channel length, we shrink the channel width, we increase the doping, and this allows us to make a smaller device but to keep the electric field inside the channel constant. Okay? So it's just a very simple shrinking of the device. And what's really beautiful about this is that you not only get more devices, so you get increased density, but because it runs at lower voltage, it consumes less power per device, and you also get higher performance because the capacitance is decreased because the size is smaller. So we have increased density at lower power and higher performance. And these three things are what actually makes Moore's Law possible, which is shown in the bottom right, this exponential increase in number of devices over time. You know, it's, it's, it's the fact that you can scale the device, keep the fields constants, and lower the voltage. And the nice thing about this, over the last, well, up until about 2005, I should say, we've been able to do this without changing the materials at all. The channel is silicon, the oxide is silicon oxide, the contacts are dope silicon or polysilicon, and that hasn't changed for that 30-year time period. We really saw this, um, this, this Moore's Law plot continue. So we've run into a problem over the last 10 years or so, and there's a couple problems. But one of the key problems is this oxide thickness. So as I mentioned, we have to shrink the oxide at the same time as we shrink the device. And here I'm just showing the dimension of channel length. So if I can't shrink the oxide, the gate basically loses control over the channel. It's just too far away to modulate the current in the channel. And the reason I'm having a hard time shrinking it is because if I shrink the oxide, down to, say, a one nanometer length, which is kind of where we were in silicon oxide about 10 years ago, we just get direct leakage current from the gate down to the source. Right? So if the device leaks, it consumes too much standby power, and it's just, it's, it's just no, longer, no longer useful. And if I keep it very far and it doesn't leak, then I can no longer control the channel with my gate. I basically lose control over the transistor. That introduces variability, introduces high off states, and it also doesn't make the transistor very usable. So we had a dilemma. Again, this was about 2005, 2006. And you really have two choices. You can either change the material, in this case, change the oxide, or you could change the geometry. So the industry first decided to change the material. So I told you you have to shrink the oxide thickness, but it's not really the oxide thickness that matters. It's the capacitance that matters. Because again, the goal is to keep the field constant in the channel as we shrink the device. So our capacitance is just equal to the dielectric constant, which is materials dependent, that's K, the area over T ox. And if I can't shrink T ox, I have to increase K to keep the capacitance constant. And that's what we did. Just by going from silicon oxide to now, we use hafnium oxide. So we get a four times increase in K. So that allows you to have the same capacitance even though your oxide thickness is, say, four times thicker. So it allows us to expand the oxide thickness and it buys us some time. But of course, this has an endpoint too, because we increase the oxide thickness by switching to hafnium oxide. Then we keep scaling and we keep shrinking and we run into the same problem. Okay? So the second choice is to change geometry, and that's where we're at um, at this stage. So if you just look at it qualitatively, I have here a FinFET. So I have, instead of a flat 
channel, I have a, a three-dimensional fin coming out of the substrate, and I've wrapped this fin with the gate, instead of having just a gate pl planer on top of a planer channel. So now I have a gate on two sides of the channel. So you can see just, again, qualitatively, you have better gate control even with the same oxide thickness, because now I have two gates instead of one. And I've introduced a new critical dimension, and that's the width of the fin, this W fin. And this dimension is, is, is critical in the sense that the thinner I can make that, the shorter I can make my, my channel length, therefore the smaller I can make my device. Okay? So now we're in this reign of thin body devices. We're constantly trying to thin down the device so we can make smaller channel devices, so we can keep Moore's Law going, in, at least in terms of density of devices. Okay? And you can imagine the next step is to have, instead of a gate on two sides, to have a gate all the way around. And this gives you ultimate electrostatic control over the channel. So if I had a cylinder, coated it completely with the gate, I could shrink my channel length even further, right? And of course, that body width is still the critical dimension in this case. I've just relabeled it D wire, as in the diameter of the wire. So in this plot, um, on, on the y-axis we show gate length, on the x-axis we show year, and you can see very nicely that the gate length has shrunk from about 1975 to about 2005, just following this uh, Dinard scaling or constant field scaling. And then it went flat. And that, that, that uh, cessation of gate length scaling is just because we couldn't scale the oxide thickness anymore, just for the reasons that I talked about in the previous slide. And so now we're in this new regime where we're continuing to scale channel length, but because we've gone to thin fets, three-dimensional structures, where now we can actually thin the channel, wrap it in a gate, and that allows us to shrink the device. And that's where we are now. This started, I think, around 2013. And there's a possibility that in the next five to 10 years, we can move to cylinders, where you have complete wrapping of the channel of a gate that allows you the, you know, the best electrostatic control um, and the critical dimension is, again, the diameter of the wire. And I have a question mark there. It's not, it's not a guarantee that that's where things will go, but from a purely electrostatic argument, that is where things should go. That's what question is, can you make it or not, okay? So what's the ideal channel material in this case? You want a cylinder. You want it to be extremely small, because as I mentioned, that diameter is the critical dimension for scaling, and it has to be semiconducting, right? And so lo and behold, we have uh, such a material. And the materials that we work on are carbon nanotubes. And so just to give you um, a bit of a background, these are the three different allotropes of sp2 carbon. On the right, we have graphite. That's the stuff that you just pull out of the ground. If you take a single sheet of graphite, a single atomic layer, you get graphene, which is a two-dimensional structure. It's just a honeycomb lattice of carbon atoms. If you take graphene and you roll it into a tube, you get a carbon nanotube. And that's the materials that we're interested in for this particular application. And that's a one-dimensional structure. Of course, we don't actually fold graphene to make the tube. These things are grown at very high temperature. Um, typically, you take a carbon source and you strike it with a laser or with an electrical arc, and you just produce this dust, and I'll show you a picture of it later. And within that dust, you have carbon nanotubes. Right? And then if you take this, this sheet and you kind of wrap it up into a ball, you get a fullerene. So C60, Buckminster Fullerene are the two kind of um, hallmark examples of that. So as synthesized, the CNTs are a one nanometer diameter wire. It's a, it's a hollow cylinder. There are no dangling bonds. It is completely self-passivated because it is, a, it is a circle, it is a cylinder. And that's, that makes it really nice for this application. It's very small, it's very thin body, and what I'll show later has very, um, really, truly exceptional transport properties. And it is semiconducting, at least some of them are, and I'll get to that too as well. So um, the first thing we set out to do was, okay, let's just build a really small device, an aggressively scaled device, and see how it does, see how its performance compares to a typical silicon device in that, in that uh, size regime. So we went out, we took one very long nanotube, it was several microns long, and we built several transistors on it of varying uh, gate lengths. And we got all the way down to nine nanometer gate length, which is a very aggressive target. That's the gate length that a commercial technology will be at in, say, or maybe eight to 10 years from now, right? And we saw two really key things. The first is there was no degradation in the performance as we shrunk down to nine nanometers. You see a bit of an increase in the off-current, but the performance did not degrade. 
And we also found that the performance as measured by current density was about three times higher than that of uh, a silicon, uh, silicon device in that uh, gate length range, okay? Um, and that's even after you normalize for pitch between tubes and fin pitch, it still came out to about three times higher current, uh, current density. So why is that? There's a, a kind of a simple way to think about it. We have this one-dimensional wire, okay? And performance in terms of resistance, you know, current density in this case, is determined by how frequently electrons scatter when they move through a material. And a strictly 1D system, because electrons can only go left or right, uh, scattering is very rare, especially at, at low voltages, voltages in the range that we operate here, okay? And this gives rise to what we call ballistic transport. So the electrons get from one side to the other without scattering off any of the lattice atoms. And that manifests itself in this, this IV curve, this is just a diagram, but the black curve is silicon, the red curve is nanotubes. Below, at the lower voltage end, there's no difference. This is the, what we call the sub-threshold region. That's limited by thermodynamics. But above that region, you see the CNTs perform, you get higher currents at lower voltages than you do with silicon. And that's all because of this ballistic transport in these, in these devices. And we saw that, that's something that we actually saw experimentally um, with this nine nanometer device. Okay, so it's very small. That lets us make small devices, so small gate lengths. And also the fact that the transport is ballistic in the, in the nanotube, it gives us high performance. So it has these two, you know, really nice properties of scaling and performance. So the question is, we see this in a single tube, what would happen if we put this in a chip, built a chip out of it? And so of course, we don't have the processing tools to do that, but we have uh, very talented, modeling uh, researchers here at IBM. So David Frank did this model, where he can take the individual device, put it into his model, and then simulate what a processor would behave like using these devices. And he has data going back several generations of processors that were actually built, and so with that he can predict what the next generations of processors would look like based on the devices that, that you provide. Okay. So on the y-axis, we have energy per transition. You can just think of that as, as power, as energy. And on the x-axis, we have performance, okay? And so, of course, you want the most performance with the lowest power. So you want to push the curve to the bottom right um, as far as you can. And if you're a chip designer, you're always making this trade-off, right? If you're working, if you're building a server, you're sort of in the top right of the curve. If you're building a cell phone, you're in the bottom left of the curve. Right? And you can do this just, you know, really just by shifting VT around. And you can see the CNTs provide, you know, a 3x improvement in power and a 3x, sorry, a 3x reduction in power and a 3x improvement in performance. So it's really a superior power performance solution as compared to silicon. And if you go to this paper, you'll see we've plotted the silicon FinFET um, calculations for several different nodes, okay? And they all kind of cluster around each other maybe a 10% difference between each of them, where the CNTs are, again, are this 3x improvement. So it's kind of like skipping several nodes of, um, of, of, of chip development if you can go from, CNT, from uh, silicon to CNTs. And again, it just comes from those basic properties that they can scale because they're small and they have um, you know, superior transport properties because of this, their one-dimensional nature. <clears throat> okay, so what would the technology actually look like? So what I have here is a picture of just one transistor. So imagine this is replicated a billion times onto a chip. So what are the requirements? One, it has to be small, right? So the gate pitch, the distance from one gate to another is around 40 nanometers. This is for a five nanometer technology node. The channel length, so the channel and the two contacts have to fit in this range. They have a 10 nanometer channel length, a roughly 10 nanometer co uh, contact length as well. And the tubes have to be placed um, very closely together, about five to 10 nanometers apart, right? This is to reduce the capacitance, but you need multiple tubes per device just to get the drive current where it needs to be to actually build a processor. And as I mentioned in the beginning of this slide, we have to make billions of them, which means they all have to operate identically, okay? So that means that the semiconducting purity needs to be, you know, in a part per billion uh, range. We need uh, minimal VT variation or, or, or threshold voltage variation from device to device. So those IV curves that I showed, all of them have to look exactly the same, all billion of them. Okay? Now, on the material side, the two things that we're really concerned with is placing them. How do you get the tubes with this pitch on a wafer? 
and the purity. And I'm going to talk about those, those two things. But so I've told you how great they are, and I told you so, showed you some modeling of what it would look like if we could actually do it. And so, and I'm not the first one to give this story. This has been talked about since they've been discovered about the last 20 years. So the question is, you know, why hasn't this happened yet? Or what's standing in the way? And so, um, what the real key difficulty is with this material and is, and why people have a hard time working with it is this. When you're making a processor from silicon, you start with a slab of silicon and you etch away the pattern that you want. And then you can add other layers and etch them away. But it's very much a top-down process. We know how to do this. Engineers love doing this. We've been doing it for the last 40 years. It's a very, I mean, we're pushing the limits as far as we can, and there's a ton of engineering that goes into it, but, it, but it's something that we understand how to do. The CNTs, and this is tr broadly true for these emerging nanomaterials in general, is a different animal. Instead of having a solid piece of silicon, I'm going to give you a pile of dust. And in this dust, I have graphitic garbage, and I have tubes, um, and I have tubes of different lengths and different diameters and different types. And I'm going to say, listen, go in that dust, get the tubes that I want, and, and go and build the structure like I have here on the, on, on the lower left, right? So this requir requires new advances in chemistry, and specifically materials chemistry. Okay, we, we can't do the top-down pattern etch if we want to use these materials. We have to develop new chemical tools to do the sorting and the assembly, and that's what we're going to talk about and what we work on here. So my favorite analogy, so uh, my product is my statue, okay? And the way Bernie did it, the way everyone does it, you take a solid block of marble and you carve away what you do don't want and you get left with a statue. And, th and that's sort of the top-down way. That's analogous to the way we, we use silicon. And the CNTs are like, listen, build me a statue, but I'm just going to give you a pile of stones. Uh, go through that, sort the exact stones that we want, and then glue them together into a statue. And if you met a sculptor that told you that's what they were doing, you would think you met the dumbest sculptor to ever walk the face of the earth. I mean, it's a terrible way of doing things, right? And it would make no sense to do it this way if you made the same product, right? But what the hope is that if we develop these tools that we can build something that far art performs the, the conventional technology. And that's, that's why we do it. As, as silly as it, as it, as it seems. Um, okay, so uh, I talked about many different types. So basically, the, the graphene can roll up in, in several different ways. And then depending on the way it rolls up, it gives you different electronic properties. So I just have a couple examples here of an armchair tube and a zigzag tube. But just know that the way that you fold it up gives you different electronic properties. So the goal is to get a method so we can isolate just the semiconducting tubes. We want transistors, we want them to turn on and off, so we want them to have a band gap. So on the bottom left, I have the band structure of the metallic and semiconducting. The reason I have them there is that you'll see those blue arrows, those are optical transitions. We can use those optical transitions to characterize how well our sorting process uh, works. Okay, so this is um, sort of a, a brief description of our sorting. So basically, we take our tubes. They're not soluble in any solvent, but you can use surfactants. You wrap the tube in a surfactant. You suspend it, in this case, in water. And then we can use column chromatography. So that's an old technique used in chemistry. You add the um, suspended nanotubes to the column. They flow through the column. And different tubes have different affinities for the column. And it has to do with not just the structure of the tube, but how that surfactant molecule is organized around the tube. So in this case, the metallic tubes have a low affinity for the column, so they go through very quickly. And the semiconducting tubes have a high affinity for the column, so they go through more slowly. So you get these blue and red solutions that correspond to metallic and semiconducting CNTs. You can do an optical spectrum. I have absorbance on the y-axis, wavelength on the x-axis. The black curve is the unsorted uh, tube, so you see both metallic and semiconducting peaks. Those come from those optical transitions that were in the previous density of states diagram. The blue solution is the blue curve, so you can see a very high metallic peak and attenuated semiconducting peak. And the red solution is the red curve, where you see a, a high semiconducting peak and you see no metallic peak. So we optically characterize it using spectroscopy. Um, we can also iterate this process. We can keep doing the separation. What you notice is the baseline keeps dropping. But if you look at that metallic region, I have it circled in blue, you can see there's no peaks there from the metallic tubes. So there's no peaks to integrate to determine 
by purity. In the end, you'd want to have some signal from metallic, some signal from semiconducting, integrate both, divide, and you'll, and you'll get your purity. But we can't have that here because our separation goes beyond the detection limits of our optical tools. So because we're at IBM, we have access to a lot of high-throughput electronics. We just said, you know, forget it. We'll just make several thousand devices, and we'll just count how many are metallic, how many are semiconducting. Okay? When we published this paper, our best, our best methods got us to uh, one in a thousand metallic tubes, 99.99% semiconductor yield. And today, we can very routinely get four nines purity, uh, pretty much on, 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 a, on, a, on a daily basis. And we're still trying to push that ahead. So that's a, that's a fantastic result for us. Um, that's better than anyone has shown. Uh, people don't typically go through the trouble of doing these measurements because, you know, we, again, we really care about trying to get this technology working. So, so we're trying to get uh, uh, access at what, what these purity levels are. But it's not quite good enough yet. As I mentioned, we want to make a billion devices, therefore a billion transistors working. So we need to be in that part per billion range, not part per 10,000. So there's a long way to go, but, but we've made a lot of progress so far. Okay, so now I have my jar of semiconducting tubes. The next question is, how do I get them on a surface where I want them? So it starts off very benignly. We have a silicon substrate. We have a thin layer of hafnium, a thin layer of silicon oxide. Then I just do lithography and etching, and I make uh, trenches in the silicon oxide. So at the bottom of the trenches, I have hafnium oxide. Then I just put it in a solution. And in this solution, I have these molecules that we've designed and synthesized in our lab that only stick to the hafnium oxide trenches. And I'll show you what those molecules are in a second. That's, we call it a selective glue. Then the CNTs um, are attracted to these molecules. So the CNTs will only go into these trenches. So this is a way to selectively place the tubes where we want them on a surface, and it's really driven by chemistry. Okay? And I put a box around this because the first two steps are something that's very common. This is the top-down approach. We really understand how to do this well, and it's a very routine process. The last ones, three and four, are, are things that people don't want us to put in their line, for example. The, it's not something that engineers like, like to see. But um, again, if you want to use these materials, you have to develop these chemical solutions um, to, to do the integration. So I'll quickly tell you about what, I just have arrows here, but I have the actual structures here. So these are the molecules that we designed and synthesized. And again, you, know, you can't buy this stuff off the shelf. You, you, you have to make it if you want to do this. So we designed this molecule. On one side, it has a hydroxamic acid. And that hydroxamic acid selectively binds to basic metal oxides, like hafnium oxide and silicon oxide. And on the top half, we have this pyridinium ion, which is attracted to the CNTs. Specifically, it's attracted to the surfactant that's around the CNTs. So we designed this molecule. It's got this hydroxamic acid. It, it diffuses in solution, and then it binds to the hafnium oxide. Then we place it in a solution of CNTs, and the CNTs bind to this molecule. Okay? Now, if you do this with the Y channel, this is about a 250 nanometer Y channel, you can see the CNTs very selectively lie nicely within the trenches. They're not particularly well aligned because the trenches are kind of wide, okay? But then you can also do this in much narrower trenches where you can induce alignment. These are just four trenches. You can see there are one or two tubes in each of the trenches, and then because we can selectively place them into these trenches, we can then put source and drain electrodes down and make, make devices. And we've shown um, a billion um, CNTs per square centimeter placed. That's about a 200 nanometer pitch, um, um, pitch layout. So what's nice about this? So we can place them, we can make devices, but now because we can deterministically place them where we want, we can actually get statistics on our material. This is about 8,000 devices that were selectively placed and measured, and we can now extract statistical properties like, for example, VT variation, Onkert variation, and now that we have these distributions, we can now begin to work on ways to narrow them down. Okay, so um, I have a couple, unanswer well, several answer questions. One is, like I said, we can routinely do four nines, but how do we get to the many nines that we need? More importantly, I think that the current methods we have, we can get there, but I don't even know how to measure it. That's, that's the real tricky part, is developing new metrology tools to actually measure purity levels of that, uh, of that order. 
And the second is, can we find better assembly techniques or can we just iterate on what we have? Currently, we can do 30 nanometer pitch reliably. We need to get down to five to 10. That doesn't seem like a lot, but it's kind of crossing that area where lithography uh, becomes challenging. And the last are really around devices, which I hope there'll be a talk later on in this seminar series on devices, but for example, how do you make extremely small contacts? I showed you small gate lengths, but can I make small contacts? And how do I reduce that variability? Because that, that's a really critical uh, uh, thing that we have to do if we're ever gonna build the technology. And the last thing I'll leave you with, so um, making, doing digital logic is the hardest thing you can do in terms of a technology uh, development. I mean, it, it is the highest bar for performance. Um, and we may get there, we may not, but what's nice about these particular materials is that as you go along this path and develop new tools to process them, to dope them, to sort them, there are other technologies that become accessible. So I'll just give you one example. Because we can sort them, um, to a high degree of purity, we can take them, we can disperse them um, as a network on a substrate and make thin film transistors with 100% yield uh, semiconducting because we rely on percolation. We've done that on plastic substrates. You could imagine making flexible electronics with these materials. So that's just one example, but there are, but there are others. Um, so I think that you know, the future is, is bright for the material, it has the right properties, and we're just beginning to develop the right tools so that we can exploit those properties for a, uh, for a technology. So with that, I thank you for your attention.